It's Monday, September 3rd. Should India have a uniform civil code? What does it mean? Uniform civil code is a proposed uniform code or law to replace personal laws of all religions. Personal laws are based on scriptures or customs and govern matters such as marriage, divorce, custody of children, maintenance and inheritance. To further clarify, in non-family civil matters and criminal matters, all Indians are governed by the same laws. Many provisions within personal laws of all religions are widely acknowledged as discriminating against women and therefore against the constitutional guarantee of equality. The Uniform Civil Code has consistently featured in the BJP's election manifestos. The Law Commission, which is the government's top advisory body on legal reform, in its paper on family law reform has now said, a uniform civil code is neither necessary nor desirable at this stage. Most countries are now moving towards recognition of difference and the mere existence of difference does not imply discrimination, but is indicative of a robust democracy. Hold on. The poll panel is not endorsing discriminating personal laws. Instead, is recommending that personal laws must be reformed and aligned with constitutional principles through amendments and codification. Remember, there have been forced changes in personal laws through piecemeal judicial and legislative intervention. The Commission, while underscoring the need to strongly protect the freedom of religion and the right to practice and propagate religion, warns against social evils seeking protection under the garb of freedom of religion. The report then lists laws that are discriminatory across personal laws of different religions and recommends changes. Here are three examples. The Commission recommends amending the law to allow a Parsi woman to retain her religious and social identity when she marries a person of another faith and to ensure that she and her children can retain inheritance rights. Also to discontinue the jury system for hearing divorce cases among Parsis that results in inordinate delays. The Commission proposed doing away with the Hindu Undivided Family or HUF. This is from the point of view of tax compliance. Quoting the former Chief Commissioner of Income Tax to say, one has to look at the revenue loss by considering the Hindu undivided family as a separate taxable entity. Essentially, HUF has been used as a loophole for tax evasion. On Muslim personal law, the Commission suggests that it be made clear in the Nikah Nama that polygamy as a criminal offence will be applicable to all communities. The Commission has reflected on other contentious matters like Nikah Halala and Triple Talaq but has refrained from making comprehensive recommendations as these matters are currently under challenge in the Supreme Court or have already been ruled upon like Triple Talaq. The Commission also recommends significant changes in secular laws. For example, the Special Marriages Act providing for a legal union irrespective of the religion of either party asks for a 30-day notice period before the registration of marriage. The Commission cautions that it offers an opportunity to the kin of the couple to discourage an inter-caste or an inter-religion marriage. Increasingly, with moves to announce such a notice online or with registrars directly contacting the parents of the couple, the purpose of the Act is being defeated. And on age of consent, the Commission says it should be uniform for men and women. Maintaining 18 years as girls and 21 years for boys simply contributes to stereotypes that wives must be younger than husbands. For merely expressing a thought that is not in consonance with the policy of the government of the day, a person should not be charged under sedition. In a stout defence of the right to criticise the government and the right to offend, the Law Commission, the government's top advisory body on legal reform, has called for a rethink on the much-abused sedition law. Here's what Section 124A of the Indian Penal Code, a law seen as putting the shackles on the constitutionally guaranteed right to free speech, says. Whoever by words, either spoken, written or otherwise, brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt, or excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government established by law, 
shall be punished with a maximum of life in prison. A perusal of National Crime Records Bureau data shows that in cases of sedition, the police take very long to file a charge sheet and the conviction rate in cases that do go to court are abysmally low. Senior lawyers say the idea behind filing a case under the section is mostly harassment and the more time the case takes to reach the courts, the greater the scope for authorities to harass the accused. The Law Commission reminds that the United Kingdom abolished sedition, citing the country did not want to be quoted as an example of using such draconian laws. Given the fact that the section itself was introduced by the British to use as a tool to oppress Indians, how far is it justified to retain Section 124A in the Indian Penal Code? As flood waters begin to recede in Nagaland, many parts of the state are reeling under an acute crisis of essential commodities like food grains and medicines. Landslides have cut off road links to several districts in the state. Relief supplies were being airdropped by Indian Air Force choppers to areas where road connections had snapped, but inclement weather had made flying impossible in the last couple of days. Twelve people have died and more than 3,000 families have been displaced over the past almost two months because of heavy rainfall. Amid complete economic breakdown and authoritarian police killings, an estimated 2.3 million Venezuelans have fled the country to seek refuge in neighboring countries since 1999. 1.5 million have left in just the last three years, according to the United Nations. The average inflation rate, the BBC says, reached 83,000% with basic items like coffee and toilet paper being bought for sacks of money. Fleeing the country is of little help. With few jobs available, Venezuelans are unwanted and unwelcome. Most of the country blames Venezuelan authoritarian President Nicolas Maduro for being unable to control spending and check the country's economic dependence on oil. Pop singer Ariana Grande, one of the many performers at Soul Queen Aretha Franklin's funeral in Detroit, USA, was groped during a casual chat with the MC Bishop Charles Ellis on stage on live TV. Earlier, when he greeted Grande on stage after her performance, he even made a joke about her name. When I saw Ariana Grande on the program, I thought that was a new something at Taco Bell. Now, in an apology, Ellis has said it was never his intention to touch any woman's breasts, and he may have been too friendly. But the question of what his hand was doing right next to her chest, far above her waist and far below her shoulder, with such blatant impunity, remains. Ironically, it was Grande who was shamed for wearing a dress too short for church. As this Twitter user pointed out, that clearly was not the problem. And finally... Amit Pangal outboxing the reigning Olympic champion Hassan Boy Dusmatov to get India's only boxing gold on the final day of the Asian Games will be one of the big takeaways for India in this edition of the Games. India equaled its best gold medal haul of 1951 and finished with its best ever medal haul overall, picking up 24 silver and 30 bronze medals, a haul that helped India finish at 8th position for the third consecutive time. Rani Rampal, captain of the Indian women's hockey team that brought home the silver, was the flag bearer at the closing ceremony. It's been an amazing fortnight. Have a great day and meet us back here tomorrow.